Um, hi, I'm Riley. I'm a fourth year chemistry major at UCLA following the pre-med path. Great. And my name is Dr. Serendipity Zaponta Renanis. Um, I have an MD and a PhD, and I am currently at UCLA. And I am in the neuro-oncology department. My specific position is clinical instructor officially, but I am in the midst of the neuro-oncology fellowship training program. I have finished the full-time part of the clinical training and um, I'm doing that part-time and now I'm doing full-time research. So it's also a postdoctoral um, research fellow position. I will be concluding this in June of next year and this is actually the completion of training finally. I mean, we all know it's lifelong learning, but uh, this will be the final uh, stopping point before moving on to a faculty position somewhere. Okay, so I guess with that, what on a day to day is your work or well, on a day to day basis, what does your position entail? Sure. So um, I thought I would kind of take it in bite sized pieces if that helps. Um, so as an MD PhD, um, that's like a dual doctoral training track as a physician scientist. So that means I'm both a medical doctor and a scientist. So I take care of patients in the neuro oncology clinic at UCLA. And I also do scientific experiments in the lab of Dr. Albert Lai, who is my current research mentor. He's also MD PhD physician scientist. Um, so as far as um, things that I'm working on, so I thought I would start just by summarizing my current research project. So right now I'm working with my team on uh, developing a new therapy that targets molecules and brain tumors, because we want to try to make our tumor treatments more effective. Basically, we're on a mission, and that mission is to win this fight against brain cancer by helping people in our clinic with medicines and trying to develop new high-tech medicines in our lab. And we do that by doing experiments on brain tumor cells. Um, once we develop a new treatment in the lab, we're gonna test it first to make sure it's safe to try and use it to help patients. And this is through a process called clinical trials. You may have heard that term. Um, if the clinical trials show that this treatment seems to help patients safely and effectively, then maybe we can use it um, to help patients all over the nation and the world if it works well. So um, delving in a little bit further than into my particular job description besides that. So neuro, that refers to neurologist. So that's a doctor who specializes in helping patients with brain related diseases. And then oncology refers to the field of tumors, as you likely know. Um, so it's basically an oncologist is a doctor who specializes in helping patients with tumors. And a tumor is basically this mass of abnormal cells. Um, we have cells that make up all the different parts of our body, the different organs, tissues, et cetera. And you zoom in to the single units you've been learning about probably in your biology classes, those are cells. And you put them all together and they work together like a community. Well, these cells have to obey certain rules as far as how they would function normally. And if something goes wrong with these cells, um, the, the police officers in the cells, if you will, are not functioning properly, then those cells can become out of control. Um, so you can think of them kind of like molecular criminals where they're doing things they're not supposed to be doing in cells. And when that happens, the cells can grow out of control and that forms a mass that's called a tumor. Um, if it's really aggressive and uh, there's certain molecules that are all going haywire, then that uh, is called cancer. Um, so cancer can be something life threatening depends on how aggressive it is, um, but our key there, the key uh, target is to figure out what are the molecules driving that uncontrolled haywire growth and how can we get it under control again. So we basically um, dedicate our time and our efforts to trying to fight these cells that have gone haywire. And uh, I guess the other thing I'd like to point out why I kind of described what the terms mean, you'll find that in medicine, it's really just, it's, it's a code, right? It's Latin and Greek phrases that you know, through the centuries, through the decades, people that have researched this, they've used that just as a tradition. But it's really simple. All you have to do is figure out what those terms mean and then translate it to everyday language. So you take neuro that's brain, oncology that's tumor, and you get brain tumor. 
And then that's what I specialize in is, you know, ology means the study of. Um, for anyone listening, if you're interested in like, hey, how come we have certain words that have come to be this way? That's something that always uh, interested me and I was curious about since I was very young in childhood. That's called etymology. So um, you can look that up. There's all sorts of things about it online, but you'll find that you can demystify pretty much all of medicine and science, all these terms that are long, just by figuring out what the Latin and the Greek mean. So a little digression there, but I thought it was a fun one. Oh, that was really interesting. <laughs> um, I guess going from there, who inspired you and what? when did you first develop your interest in your field? Yeah, so I think I'll have a long winded answer to that, but uh, I, I consider my mother and father as my first mentors and teachers. Um, I really feel blessed with having special types of parents. I think that they really kind of had a vision for um, how they wanted to raise me. So they really made learning a lot of fun, you know, and so um, just in interacting with them really as long as I can remember since infancy, uh, they made learning like a game. It's like, oh, look at this. Oh, this is interesting. And just exposing me to all sorts of things. Um, so I think they kind of really mentored me and inspired me to continue learning through my whole life, just because the, the whole time it was really, um, a game and something so gratifying and interesting. So I'll give you a few examples of that and then we can kind of zoom into how I got to neuro-oncology. But uh, yeah, my mom taught me the alphabet for fun when I was three months old and apparently I caught on. So I was reading words at six months old and then she taught me to spell my long name serendipity using the Mickey Mouse song because it apparently fits, you know, the M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E -E, and my name somehow fit that as well. But, you know, just little things like that. Um, so I was immersed in a lot of just reading, writing, thinking, um, being curious. I remember my dad got me my first microscope when I was about four years old and we used to talk about like chemical elements, the solar system, and just really anything going to museums. So I feel like um, the family support system you have around you is so important. You know, those early years are, are really important. So if you are, um, you know, you have an extended family network where there are younger people in your family, you're actually in a position even now um, to be a mentor um, to those uh, young children coming up and to say, oh, this is exciting, you know, and I think the exposure's there and if they just learn to explore and think, it's really the same pattern um, that happens all throughout life. So. Um, I recall being interested in becoming a doctor since early childhood. I think it was around age three, I guess, when I was exploring all these different things, just really being fascinated about how things work. Um, but really the human body and the brain, I guess you've come to that realization as well with your neuroscience interest, Riley. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I remember wanting initially to be an astronaut doctor. I was really into NASA, <laughs> but, but then I really enjoyed the, um, the concept of doing scientific experiments and using a microscope to, to look at cells. Um, I really also like teaching and presenting uh, my work. I remember um, an early, I guess I was about, yeah, there, a lot of things happened at three years old, <laughs> but uh, I had this uh, poster presentation or we put together a poster um, with my mom uh, at home is just a, a project. And then there was like this finished product. And I was like, wow, this is neat. And I ended up getting to present that in school and even up to all of the older elementary school age children. So that was a really formative experience for me that you can work hard on a project and have the chance to share that with other people in a teaching format. And I didn't realize all of these things put together actually add up to MD PhD. I didn't know that was called a physician scientist track, but um, that's actually what it ended up being. And I, I learned about this um, when I was an undergraduate at Cornell University and I was a neurobiology major there, but getting involved with research there um, and then um, basically finishing because I finished in three years there, just had a lot of AP credits um, from high school. And then I um, had the opportunity, which is another huge blessing to work with a neurosurgeon who, um, his name is Bill Broadus. He's also MD, PhD, and also a Cornell alumnus. Uh, but I worked in his laboratory on brain tumors. It was my first exposure to neuro-oncology then. So I had all of my neuroscience um, knowledge from undergraduate 
training and I got to implement it into a real life problem. And then, but that was my first exposure to oncology, to cancer cells and realizing, wow, these cancer cells can be pretty aggressive. It's a life-threatening situation in some instances and in a lot of instances. And we can use the knowledge that we've gained in our training to actually try to extend people's lives. And so I was like, wow, this is really a mission worth pursuing. And then I also realized in that experience that if I wanted to be engaged in that active process of making discoveries, that that's where being a scientist was going to be important in my training too. So that's where I decided to pursue the dual degree of the MD and the PhD. Um, both tracks allow you to interface with patients or patient related issues, but from different vantage points. But the nice thing about doing both is you can interface between two worlds. It's kind of like speaking two different languages at times and you get to kind of be that interpreter. Um, being at that interface in research is called translational research. <laughs> it's interesting they use that word translation, but you probably heard the term from bench to bedside, right? That's referring to the laboratory bench and bringing that discovery into a new treatment that you can use for patients at the bedside. So it's really rewarding to kind of go back and forth between those things. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, it does. And I guess in addition to, you mentioned Cornell, I guess how, uh, what are other classes or programs that you participated in to get to where you are now? Yeah, so I think I can just kind of outline that given the audience we're talking to today. Um, so as I mentioned, I think um, the important thing is just staying curious, keep asking questions, pursue what your natural interests are, and uh, never putting limitations on what those questions are, or what you can do um, with your interests. So um, I went to a place called the Governor's School, which is a college preparatory school in Virginia. I'm from New York City originally, but then had moved down to Virginia. And then after that, I went to Cornell University, as I mentioned. Um, I think it's really important to seek out mentorship. I mentioned the mentorship from my parents early on, which is huge. And then as you move on in the professional arena, it's really important, especially I feel for young women, for girls moving on as we're kind of breaking the glass ceiling and looking for environments where they're very conducive to nurturing people like us. UCLA is one of those places for sure. Um, but looking for people, there's kind of a natural um, attraction, proclivity, um, as you encounter people, just like when you meet people in your classes, right? There's some people you're closer to than others, and it's just a natural part of your personality, your interests. The same thing happens um, as far as interacting with teachers. So if you're in a class that's really interesting to you, you want to know more about that, talk to the teacher. Say, oh, I'm really interested in this. Are you doing any research on this topic or not? Um, they can point you in the right direction to either their own laboratories or colleagues that are working on those topics. But I think that being friendly, humble, and just engaged, outgoing, and teachable can go a really long way. Because if um, people who are established scientists and doctors, if they see someone who has a great attitude, is willing to learn, and is honest and open, um, that's a perfect breeding ground for a, a future doctor and scientist. Um, as far as other things, I think um, because I was so interested in the brain, I always read everything I could about the brain. Every chance I got, I remember even in high school, any type of term paper project that they assigned, um, they always, or I always turned into, oh, maybe I can write on this topic in neuroscience. So I wrote several papers on like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, different things, um, neurochemistry, et cetera, any way that I could involve my interests in whatever assignment was given to me. So there are ways you can be creative like that. Um, let's see, after I finished at Cornell, I did finish a year early. Um, I did mention uh, seeking out that mentorship with the neurosurgeon. So sometimes it's just a matter of contacting them. You never know who will be open to um, mentoring someone. You'd be surprised. Um, there are a lot of people who once they reach a certain stage in their career, they're looking to pass along what they've done. It's just like if you've run a relay race in school and you have to pass that baton to someone else and you know you're winning, you want to keep that momentum going, right, of what you've accomplished in the field. And by mentoring other people, teaching other people, young people such as yourselves that are watching this, 
um, you'll be surprised. People are really excited to, to do this. And I think if you find that perfect match of just kind of natural personality chemistry, uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there. That was a lot of great advice. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I guess I'm on fine. this long journey, um, if any, what obstacles did you overcome? Yeah, so I think that's a very insightful question uh, because it acknowledges one thing, and that is anything that is worth doing in this life always contains some element of challenge as part of the package. So rather than calling them obstacles, I like to call them challenges or opportunities. Um, because that's what they truly are, right? They're really adventures, even though they don't seem that way, maybe when they first come up. Uh, but I feel like the reason that we're given certain challenges in our lives is in order to grow and become fully what we're designed to become and accomplish in our lives. And that's different for every person. It's unique for every individual. Um, I'd say that science and medicine, they are long roads, but they are very exciting ones. They're unlike any other field that's out there. So. Um, I can give a few examples of that, um, but uh, yeah, as far as the trajectory, I think I started talking about it and quite finished, so I can revisit that. Um, but in order to become a medical doctor, so let's take that trajectory first. So obviously you'll go, you'll finish high school and then you'll go to college of some sort and you have to pursue what's called a pre-medical track. And so you have certain requirements of coursework that you have to take in order to be accepted to medical school. You apply to medical school, like you apply to college, kind of the, the uh, similar interview process. And then you're in um, medical school for four years. During that time, you have some more coursework and then you have your clinical training, which is kind of like an apprenticeship. You follow along the more experienced doctors, those that are in training and those that are faculty, but you learn just on the job when you're on the clinics. And then you go to residency. So even though you have the MD degree already, you don't yet have all the knowledge you need to practice independently. You have to learn how to take care of patients safely. So the um, length of the residency is dependent on the type of specialty you choose. So different types of specialties, examples of that are like internal medicine, uh, which is more the, the general uh, type of um, medical field. Um, and then there's family medicine, which is even more broad. And then there's specializations such as surgery um, or there's neurology, which, which is what I pursued. Um, I guess I would say as you're pursuing things and you encounter what you think are obstacles or things you didn't expect, I think it's always important to ask yourself, okay, am I enjoying this or what is the reason that I went into this? I think that it's always important to keep the right motives when you go into different fields. Um, life is too valuable and too short, so to speak, to pursue something for the wrong reasons. So it's really important that what you pursue is something that matches your natural interests and talents that you've kind of had your whole life. You'll probably discover new interests as you're exploring different fields. Um, but you know, for me, I just as an example, so I actually went into the specialty of neurosurgery first, and I did that for two years. And yeah, I'm very hands-on, I'm a violinist as well, and so I like working with my hands. Um, but then I realized, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day, and how do I really want to spend those 24 hours, right? Um, you can't do everything, but you can do something, and you can do something significant. But for me, I really like the research, as I mentioned, and I'll come back to that PhD track in a second. But um, I really wanted to split my time more between being in the clinic and being in the research field. And I felt like by switching to a specialty like neurology, it would allow you to spend more of those 24 hours, uh, that chunk per day on actually planning experiments and, and designing studies and interfacing with discoveries coming out of the lab directly. So. I guess all of that to say every specialty is important and has a part to play in this whole fight against cancer and everyone's kind of personality and interest is different. And so it's about finding that perfect match and that's kind of a discovery process. Um, so I hope that answers the question of challenges. <laughs> I think it's kind of a different one. It's like where you're like, oh, this is different from the w way that I thought it would be. Um, and then it just, uh, I guess my reason for mentioning that is that it's really important to stay honest and um, keep your integrity and your character as you go through things. And that 
also involves being honest with yourself. If you're not happy in a particular specialty, um, you've probably found that when you've taken some coursework, right? You sign up for a course, it sounded interesting, like, oh, this is not what I expected at all, right? And you have an opportunity to drop the class or add another one, uh, sometimes within a period. So it's kind of the same concept. I think the flip side of that is um, persistence, right? So you don't wanna quit something too soon. I think that hardship or challenge, things aren't always gonna be easy. And that often it might indicate that you're in the right field because it, you have an opportunity to grow. So it's a balance, right? You don't wanna jump into something and it feels uncomfortable, so you jump out right away. I think you have to allow yourself to grow through that discomfort until it becomes comfortable. Um, but I think that's where having mentorship and feedback um, your support system, family becomes really important, especially as you face challenges. Um, we weren't, weren't meant to navigate this type of thing alone. And I think that sometimes with the hustle and bustle, people can be made to feel like they're alone, but they're actually not. Um, so I think reaching out for help, um, being open, knowing people that you can trust, again, having that mentorship and uh, really val taking time to value family support that you have that's really important along the way. Wow, that was so much advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. I guess just any last comments for what would you say to a student who wants to do what you do? Yeah, I, I feel like I pro could probably fill up a whole book of comments for that last question, uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, you know, I think doing an interview like this is valuable for having gone through the whole process, right? Because sometimes we're, we have our heads down and we're so focused on getting the tasks done associated with our training that it's important to take a time like this to step back and say, kind of count your blessings and appreciate all of the things along the way and all of the people along the way. So I think what I would say is several things. One is you were created and designed for a specific, unique purpose in life to accomplish something that is uniquely given to you. You have God-given talents that are uniquely yours. So um, what I see that often happens with young people, especially young women coming into the field, they might come into a field that is traditionally male dominated and think, oh, I've never seen any women or girls doing this before. Is this something for me? Or you know, there are these kind of preconceived notions that you can start thinking about. But the important thing is to not try to fit into society's mold or somebody else's mold of what you or others think a doctor or scientist should look like. Um, I think that if you're truly interested in science and medicine, then you should uh, definitely pursue this and see how where your interests will take you. Um, basically, you shouldn't like, I guess, the, the closest experience of um, that type of thought process for me was selecting a specialty, right? It's like I talked about the experience of neurosurgery versus neurology and what was the best fit for me. Um, you should not have to change who you are to fit a profession that you think is for you, right? I think there's, you already have a natural set of talents and interests and those will naturally mesh already with an existing specialty that's out there. And um, kind of, it all depends on the field that you're pursuing. Sometimes like from a research standpoint, um, you may encounter a field that no one has researched before, which I think in this day and age means a little rare, but really there are things and ideas that no one has thought about yet. And so you might have that next set of ideas and questions. So if it doesn't exist, you can go ahead and create it. So I think don't set limitations on yourself based on what you see already exists because the world might be waiting for the ideas that you have. Um, I guess the other things to mention too, is that as you go through this process, there are peaks and valleys, there are successes and failures as with anything worth doing as we talked about, but it's really important to remember that your value is not based on what you do. You don't have to try to prove anything to anyone. Your role is to explore and discover what it is that you've been gifted to and contribute to the world. And as you're doing that exploration, hang on to your character and your integrity. You know, the importance of persistence, hard work. I know you've probably heard a lot of these things from other people in mentoring positions, but it's really true. Uh, 
character is so much more important than success or failure. Doing the right thing, uh, whether anybody is watching or not. Um, I guess I'll land here, but uh, you know, one I guess take home point is that I think that the most valuable things in life, you know, in science and medicine and life in general, are the things that are in the hidden places, right, in the obscurity. So the goal here is not to become famous, to have your name in lights, but it's really to make an a, a lasting impact on the people that come across your path. And so, you know, that one on one interaction that you have, think about, you know, some examples of what I just said, right? It's like, you think about doctors and nurses in the hospital that are saving lives in the middle of the night in the hospital, they don't have an audience watching, but they're the most important people to that patient at that time. The most important scientific discoveries, right, were made at a laboratory bench, where somebody might have been working long hours at night because it was exciting to them, but nobody was around to see it at that moment. They'll find out later. But, you know, all of these little exciting things can happen in hidden places. What else? Even just like human development, right? In, in a womb that's hidden from the world. And then finally, with our favorite topic of the brain, all of these creative thought processes that go on in the brain. We don't really have a way of visualizing those thoughts, but they're going on and they're very important, but they're all hidden, so to speak, right? So just remembering that fame isn't everything and um, there, there's something to be said about obscurity. There's a, a lot of important things born in that. So I hope, um, I know that was pretty deep and philosophical, but <laughs> tried to put it in a nutshell for you. No, oh, thank you so much for your time. All your advice and just your journey is just extremely valuable to hear. Well, thanks. I, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And yeah, if people have questions, they can look me up online. I'm happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with me.